Good afternoon. On behalf of the Historical Society of Hartford County, welcome to our talk today, The Flowers That Bloom in the Spring. I'm Jackie Seneschal, your host, for this afternoon's Brown Bag Lunch. It's springtime. I love daffodils. They're my personal favorite. We have them on my kitchen table. Um, but I also like the tulips and the hyacinths <clears throat> and the other flowers that come with us at springtime. Today, we're going to talk about some of the history and the stories that go with those. Um, we'll talk about financial disasters. We'll talk about romantic liaisons. Our guest today is Meg Algren. She's a master gardener and a professor emeritus of communications from Towson University. Meg's going to give us a background of these flowers and bulbs, and she'll also give us some tips on how to keep our gardens fresh and looking good spring, summer, and fall. Meg, where do we begin? Good heavens. Uh, hello, um, and welcome to the flowers that bloom in the spring. It's, uh, it's a little tip of the hat to Gilbert and Sullivan, but it's not completely accurate because we're going to be looking at flowers that also bloom in the summer. We're going to be concentrating on flowers that come from bulbs, corms, rhizomes, and tubers, um, which are four commonly spring, early summer uh, sources for flowers. But we, before we go into the flowery part, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Harford County Master Gardener Program. It's part of the University of Maryland Extension Program, um, which is a service provided by the state that helps farmers and residential gardeners, both flower and vegetable, um, Im improve their, uh, their capabilities. They're great programs for adults and young people and youngsters. So if you are interested in going whole hog and becoming a master gardener, you can contact Joyce Browning at 410-638-3200. Five five. That's 410-638-3255. And you can go to the website also, which is the Harford County Master Gardener website, and take a look at some of the programs that are open to the public. Well, what a crazy spring this one's been so far. Forget those magnolias this year, at least around my house. Um, the buds were open far enough so that when we got that 20 degree chill a couple of weeks ago, they were nipped and they went from pink to brown in a couple of hours. Oh dear. Uh, even my daffodils were a bit bothered. Uh, leaves and buds for daffodils can handle 25 degree temperature as long as it's not a prolonged freeze and the daytime temperatures rise above freezing. Tater Tate, which are those little sweet ones that are early daffodils, um, they weathered the freeze fairly well, although I did lose a couple, but not enough to ruin the clump. Um, the wind didn't help. We had wind and um, some real freezing, sleety kind of stuff that, that uh, did some damage. So where did these little sweethearts come from? Daffodils originally came from the Mediterranean region, and um, the Greeks loved them. They have a wonderful myth about how the heck they, they uh, developed their little bend of the head. Now, I have to tell you, all daffodils are narcissus, but not all narcissus are daffodils. Narcissus is the big family that is the... Uh, the over umbrella for daffodils includes uh, a number of other things too. So where did they come from? Well, there was a wild wood nymph named Echo who fall, fell in love with this very callow, uncaring, self-centered young man, Narcissus. And Echo ran around trying to hunt him down, get him to pay attention to her, not in the least. He was too interested in himself. And she would call his name and it would fade into the distance as he walked away. Narcissus, 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 Narcissus. 
Well, Hera, who was queen of the uh, of the gods and goddesses, was a good friend of Echo's and really got annoyed. Had a talking to the young man, and he didn't seem to care at all. So she said, "Okay, fine and dandy, you will fade away just like dear Echo has faded away." And so she put a curse on him. He was out wandering around one day, saw a pond, looked in, and saw his reflection. And he became so intrigued with how handsome he was that he stared and stared and stared and starved to death, which is why daffodils have that little bend in the neck. It's from staring at themselves in the pond. Well, anyhow, remember back fall. Oops. Remember back fall when you every time you had time to plant your your daffodil or tulip bulbs, the weather was crummy. It was raining and forty degrees temperature. If you are one who never quite got those bulbs planted in October and November, you're probably wondering what to do with them now. Well, those bulbs are little containers for the nutrients that are required for the plant to kick up the leaves and the flowers. Bulbs need to go through a period of chill, daffodil and tulip, for about 12 weeks, which is why bulbs much further south of us don't really do very well. Uh, but going back to your bag of bulbs or your box of bulbs, there's a real good chance that right now they are toast. Take a look at them, feel them if they feel mushy or they feel empty and kind of flabby. Um, if you have nothing better to do, you can plant them, <laughs> but it's highly doubtful that you'll get anything out of them. For sure, you're not going to get any blooms this year. Um, quite frankly, most likely they won't come up at all. So next year, when you buy your bag of bulbs and when the weather, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and the December holidays, again, keep you from getting them into the ground, don't worry. Wait for a nice, sunny, warmer day at the beginning of January and plant away. The ground will be frozen, but only for an inch or so, depending on what kind of weather we've had. Plant them just like you would have in the fall, six to seven inches down. Um, you may not get as many bulbs. Uh, I'm sorry, you may not get as many blossoms um, that spring, next spring, as you would have if you had gotten them in the ground in the fall. But give them another year cycle and they'll be back to normal. So. Just a couple tips here about bulb and flower care. So <clears throat> when should you when should you fertilize? Some growers suggest fertilizing as soon as the leaf tips appear above the ground. Gently dig around the clump, not into the clump, but around the clump, and sprinkle the fertilizer there. Use a fertilizer that is higher in phosphate and lower in nitrogen. Too much nitrogen often results in the plant putting its energies into growing leaves and not flowers. It is also a major cause of bud blast. This is examples of blood, bud blast. Bud blast is when a bud turns brown either before it opens or shortly after it opens. And it's generally caused by too much nitrogen or too shallow a planting or a combination of both. So follow the directions on how deep you should plant your bulbs, different bulbs, different depths. Measure the hole from the bottom where the bulb is going to sit. Um, size does matter, especially in the case of tulips, the bigger the bulb, the better. As far as fertilizer is concerned, what you want is a 5% nitrogen, 10% phosphate, and 10% potassium or potash. There are several bulb fertilizers out there, or you can mix your own, I mean, some people do, but I would suggest keep, 
make life simple. Just keep it easy. Find a good bulb fertilizer. Make sure it's a 5, 10, 10, and then follow the directions. Uh, a significant portion of good gardening includes following the directions on the packages. Once your bulbs have stopped blooming, do not cut the leaves off. The bulbs need the leaves to make food for the following year. Some people like to braid daffodil leaves um, because they feel it looks a little bit better. I would highly recommend not doing that. The braiding injures the leaves and that affects how many blossoms you're going to get next spring. If the leaves really bother you that much, you can plant pansies uh, around them or even perennials that will come up every year and help disguise the leaves. When the leaves turn brown and yellow, remove them by gently pulling them. You'll know when they're ready to come out because they will pull out easily. Then compost the leaves. Recycle, 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 recycle. If you have planted bulbs, oh, and look at those, aren't they gorgeous? They're gorgeous, they are. They, I love the way the colors work. Yeah. If you have planted <laughs> bulbs in your lawn or are thinking about doing it, and they are such beautiful displays. I love that one that says spring. Um, there was a yard on Jarrettsville Pike where they had planted that. It was just glorious and coming up with the, the uh, crocuses that said spring. Uh, go ahead and do it, but remember you can't cut your lawn for six weeks after it stopped blooming because those crocus leaves need to make nutrients for the following years worth of blossoms. Crocuses do naturalize, which means that if you leave them in the ground, the display will get larger and larger each year. Always deadhead tulips. It prevents the plant from expending energy on making seeds. The vigor of tulip bulbs truly quickly declines if they're not deadheaded. You'll lose them within a year or two years. Yes. True, tulip bulbs decline eventually, but there's really no sense in carrying along the process. If you do, you do not need to deadhead daffodils or other spring bloomers, but if you have the time, go ahead and do it. I would also suggest that you not dig up your winter hardy bulbs and store them for planting again in the winter, uh, in the fall. It was commonly done at one time, but there's really no reason to do it. And in fact, you're exposing them to the possibility of injury and fungus, um, rodent issues, and you're just creating more work for yourself. Clumps of daffodils can be separated every three to five years. No doubt you will find offset bulbs, and those are those little ones along the side of the daffodil. Gently pull apart the bulb and plant the offset just like you would any other bulb. I always mix my big bulbs with my offsets because it'll take a couple of years for those little bulbs to get big enough to start blooming well. Tulips do lose vigor over time as do hyacinths. And while fertilizing does help, eventually they pretty much stop blooming. Two or three good years is about all you can expect for a big display. Tulips are a short-term investment in your garden. And the Dutch found out in 1637 that they were a short-term investment for fortunes. Uh, the tulip bulb crash of 1637 ruined hundreds of wealthy people who had bought hundreds of thousands of dollars with the bulbs, which resulted in two or three little plantings out in their front yard. Um, tulips were first imported to Holland from the Middle East in the late 1500s. And actually there was a lot of smuggling going on because they came from Turkey originally and the Turks were not interested in sharing the beauty of the bulbs. Um, so there's a black market for tulip bulbs. Um, in, in fact, there were a 
few assassinations dealing with truly dealing with some lower level um, Turkish uh, officials who had smuggled it, uh, let bulbs be smuggled out of the country. Wow. Yeah, it just, yeah, right. But, but they got them out of the country and um, the Turks were no longer able to control the market. The craze hit and in 16, in the early 1630s. In 1637, at the height of the bulb mania, tulip mania, a single bulb could sell for as much as $750,000 in today's money. I wouldn't um, plant a lot of tulips they, <laughs> in, in that world. world. <laughs> um, unfortunately for too many, they <laughs> used the bulbs as collateral for loans. Well, bulb vigor declines. <laughs> so it didn't take long before Within weeks in 19 in 1637, investors became beggars when the market fell. Um, I wonder what those investors would say today about Kuchenhof Gardens, located not too far from Amsterdam, where more than seven million tulips burst into bloom every spring. We could have bought the world. Tulips are lovely and they do do well in vases. And in my opinion, that's kind of where they belong. I don't bother growing them. I live in deer country and the deer consider them lollipops. Mm -hmm. They munch the buds even before they're open. Squirrels and chipmunks and voles love to eat them once you plant them. And the bulbs die out after a couple of years of Really not a tulip thing. I prefer bulbs that require far less fussing and expand to naturalize, um, such as whoopsie, uh, such as um, grape hyacinths, yeah, grape hyacinths, snowdrops, glory of the snow, and wood, or often called English hyacinths. They're popular hardy, not bothered by the beasties, and they naturalize and expand with a little bit of fertilizing once or twice a year. If, however, you are committed to tulips, there is a way to discourage them <coughs> from being eaten by rodents. Plant them in tulip cages. There you go. And there's one of cute little Squirrels, squirrels, voles, and chipmunks. Not surprisingly, you can buy tulip cages online or at a garden center, or you can make your own using hardware cloth, which is galvanized uh, metal wire. Use a half inch mesh, um, half inch hole mesh. Um, make a little box, dig a hole as deep as you should, put the, which is going to be for tulips about six, seven inches, put it down on the bottom, put your tulip bulbs in it, put some fertilizer in there, put the lid on, and then fill it with dirt. The bulbs will find their way out of the mesh the following year. And you can, you know, keep doing it until you either decide to need to replace your tulips or you're tired of it. Just pull the, pull the little cage out and uh, make sure it's hardy and safe and start all over again. Oh, one more, look at this stupid squirrel. One more word of advice. Do not mix cut daffodils with tulips or just about any other flower without allowing them to stand in a vase by themselves for overnight. That guck that comes out of the ends of tulips I'm sorry, of daffodils affects the longevity of the flowers that it shares in the vase. So either leave your, your uh, daffodils alone in a vase or cut them and let them sit overnight before you mix them with your other spring flowers. Good tip, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, so just a couple of hints here on how to get the most out of your fall planting efforts. 
There are summer bulbs that are ready to pick up the slack when your spring bulbs have died back. As I mentioned earlier, there are true bulbs like tulips and daffodils. There are corms with an M, C-O-R-M. They produce crocuses and gladiolas and a whole bunch of other things. There are tubers and they produce dahlias and begonias. And then rhizomes. And rhizomes uh, grow lily of the valley and canna lilies, which are not lilies at all. Uh, the summer is loaded with plants that grow from these three sources and some from true bulbs. Not all of the corms, uh, tubers, and rhizomes are, are perennial in our growing zone, which is 6B or 7A, depending on how you look at things. Uh, but don't let that discourage you from giving the more tender topical versions a try. Since Easter is just around the corner, since Easter is just around the corner, I'm going to start with lilies. They are a true bulb. There are about 90 species of lilies. Easter lilies are trumpet lilies, originally from the Philippines. Although there are some wonderful trumpet lilies that come from, um, from Greece and again from Turkey. Um, the two most popular lilies you can find at garden centers around here are Asiatic. And those are those wonderful yellows and oranges and reds. Um, they bloom in June and July and grow to be about two to four, maybe five feet tall. They are rarely fragrant. And then there are the Orientals, and those are those great pink ones, pinks and whites and reds. They are very fragrant. Um, they generally bloom in August. Uh, but they grow much taller. Usually need staking, they'll grow to four to six feet. Lilies love sun. They love well-drained soil and lots of fertilizer. They are heavy feeders. Start for about two weeks before they bloom and continue on for about six weeks afterwards. A liquid fertilizer once a week, again, low in nitrogen, high in phosphate. If you purchase your lilies in a pot, you can plant them outside in your garden uh, once they're finished blooming. And you can, uh, the hole needs to be a little bit larger than the pot. Again, the bulbs need their leaves on. So if you're going to, if they finish blooming, don't cut the leaves off, dig a hole, and plant your lilies in the, in the hole. If, however, you want to keep the foliage on your patio for some reason, that's fine. Keep fertilizing them. And then once the foliage has died back again, brown or yellow, you can plant the lily bulbs um, about, again, six feet, uh, six feet, six inches deep. Um, if you buy the bulbs themselves, please make sure you plant them with the pointed end up. They are not real good at turning themselves around. So you may not get as many lilies as you had expected. Um, unfortunately, rodents also love lily bulbs. So if you're serious about them, you need to bury them in cages, just like you did with the tulips. Lilies will naturalize if they're well fed and happy, so your clump should expand and grow as the years go on. Again, after about three to five years, dig up your, your uh, lily bulb cages, open them up, and gently break apart your offsets and plant those again like you did with the tulips. Since Lily foliage disappears in, as the summer wears on, and the best time to do this in, is in the fall. You're going to need to mark your clumps <laughs> before fall, um, and the foliage disappears, or you'll be moving for another year. Okay. All parts of lilies are extremely poisonous, especially 
to cats. Oh, there we go. That's a lily ball. And then you can see that's the little offset on the side. Mm -hmm. And that is an Asiatic lily blooming in a pot, growing in a pot. Here are our Easter lilies or trumpet lilies. And the ones on the left are more cat safe than the ones on the right. A few grains of pollen licked from a cat's fur is enough to cause fatal kidney failure in a cat. Lilies are also poisonous to human beings, especially small children, and the pollen is very toxic. So kids go up to smell the flowers, get the pollen on their skin, on their fingers, could possibly put the pollen in their mouths and could become quite sick. So I don't want anyone to say, well, I can't, means I can't get used to lilies. That doesn't mean that. It just means you need to be aware of the toxicity of the plant. I have lilies. I have cats. I removed the pollen from the stamen, which is what it has been done on the lilies on the left. So you can't see the yellow. Mm -hmm. The ones on the right still have their, their um, the pollen, uh, uh, the stamens there. So what you need to do is remove it and at least cut down the possibility of problems. But again, the whole plant is poisonous. So you need to put it someplace where kids and cats and pets won't get into trouble. I'll take a look at another summer bloomer, popular summer bloomers, begonias. And begonias are, bloom, are grown from tubers or rhizomes or roots, it's a very group. Rhizome begonias generally have those colorful leaves that grow and the rhizomes grow along the surface, like the ones in the lower right. Um, those are our house plant um, begonias. They grow out and about and do well in Florida, but it's just too cold for those begonias here in Maryland. Um, but if you have them inside, take them out in the summer, put them in a dappled sun area, feed them, water them, and be prepared to repot them in the fall when you bring them in after a summer at the spa. <laughs> Uh, the other begonias we have are those little waxwing begonias, and everybody's seen those. Those grow from roots. Those are, they grow about five inches tall, six inches tall. Lots are used in, in borders. They come in pink, white, and red. And the foliage is also green or red. Um, while they come in very small sizes, if you've ever had big leaf begonias or the dragon wing begonias, they are also a form of wax wing begonia and are grown from roots. Tuberous begonias are the ones that you see in the lower left. You often see them uh, <coughs> potted up as hanging pots in the uh, in garden centers. Um, you can grow them yourselves or you can buy them in the garden center. They're a little tricky doing it yourself. Uh, begonia tubers take several weeks to do what's called waking up. So you'll need to get started now. Um, if you buy the ones at the big box store that come in the bags and you get the tuber out, and if it doesn't have anything growing on it, mm, like that, that's a bad sign. It's going to be several months, like the end of the summer, before you, you can get something out of it. So I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying be very aware that they're slow growers and you need to make sure that the tubers you're getting are going to support the kind of commitment you've made to tuberous begonias. Um, but grow them, enjoy them, uh, and by all means, dig them, and you can 
put them in a safe spot in the over the winter. Needs to be cooled, but they can't freeze. Just put them in sawdust or um, koi, that stuff that is um, made from coconut hulls. Uh, put them in a safe place. If your garage doesn't freeze, then hold them out in the spring, in March, and put them on your windowsill and start waiting for those little little shoots to poke up. They are, begonias are heavy feeders. Um, they also like a five, I, I'm sorry, they like a 10 high nitrogen, five phosphate, and 10 uh, potash. What did I tell you? I told you the wrong thing to do. They are heavy feeders. They like 10 nitrogen, 10 phosphate, and five potash. Um, Dahlias are pretty much the same way. Dahlias are grown from tubers, um, but it doesn't take very long for them to wake up. They like a lot of sun. Um, plant them in early May when the um, there's no danger of frost. Sometimes it's not till Mother's Day, I can tell you, but you don't mind dragging the little pots in and out. If you plant them in pots, you can do it. Um, and again, you can store them along with your begonias. You can't, you can't allow the tuber to freeze. Gladiolas come from corners. And here's a lovely, lovely grouping of dahlias and lilies and glads. Uh, just some wonderful summer, summer uh, flowers. Glads grow from corns. You need big corns. This is important. Um, a sunny location and adequate water, but it needs to be well drained soil. Plenty of sun, and in 60 to 90 days, they'll bloom. It's a slow go. They generally need to be staked and put someplace out of the wind, and for sure, they need to be dug and stored if you want to save them. For the next year. This is one of those deals. If you have a good location and you want to give it a try, go ahead. Um, I'm not nuts about them because I've never had a fabulously wonderful location for them. It's a lot of effort. It's one stalk of flowers and that's it. <laughs> but they are lovely. And they're kind of exciting to try. I've never tried gladiolas, but don't be disappointed if they don't look like the ones you can get in the supermarket. Our last summer category of plants are those that grow from rhizomes. Oops. Lily of the Valley, I can't see that. That's what they are to the left. What's not to love about a Lily of the Valley? They naturalize. They like part shade. They're not fussy about soil, a little bit of moisture, and they're just happy as a clam in water. Um, slow release fertilizer, not fussy about fertilizer. The fragrance is divine, and the blossoms are long lasting both in vases and out in the garden. Um, the pips spread in the pip communities, and you can separate them every three to five years. And Keep those lily, the lily of the valley growing. There is a drawback. The plant is poisonous. Um, so be mindful about where you place it, the flowers and the leaves. If you have kids and pets, again, it's, it's not that you shouldn't grow them, but you should be aware that um, maybe not along the most enticing garden path, but a little further back. Canna lilies. Canna lilies are not lilies at all. But I'll tell you, they are worth giving it a try, even if you decide not to dig them up in the fall. I put mine in huge pots on our deck, and they're just stunning. People can't believe it, and they are so easy. Um, they need four to five hours of serious sun. I was lucky to get mine from friends because they really Bread. So if you have friends who have canna lilies, they're probably uh, a good candidate to, to borrow some. Um, 
follow the directions from your buddy, or if you buy them, follow the directions that come with them. Um, they are heavy feeders, again, low on nitrogen, higher on phosphate. Um, it's a wonderful display combining dramatic foliage and uh, fabulous flowers. There's a caveat to this one too. Japanese beetles loves, love the leaves and will devastate a plant in a matter of hours. I would not suggest using a Japanese beetle trap. Um, what it does is it lures the beetles from your neighbor's yard into your yard. Most properties, most residential yards are too small really to accommodate a Japanese beetle trap effectively. So what I have found is hand picking is the best. I very soapy water in the jar, as you can see. Um, scrape the beetles into the jar with the lid on the, um, from the jar, put the lid on. The beetles die very, very quickly. Um, and I check my cannas three times a day because truly you can walk out in the morning and they'll be beautiful. And if you don't check them in the beetles, then at them by five o'clock, you want to cry. Um, I have heard that cedar oil spray works as a deterrent. I have never used it, um, but if you want to give it a go, if you don't like killing beetles in soapy water or you don't have the time to do it, um, yeah, give, the, give the cedar oil a, a shot, see what happens. These are just some of the few uh, options you have for spring and summer bloomers from bulbs, tubers, rhizomes, and corns, and lots and lots more. And uh, I would suggest that you borrow a book from the library and take a look, see, and figure out what you want, and then do some catalog shopping or go shopping at your garden center. So I've got a question. I got paperweights at Christmas time. Can I plant those out in my garden and have them bloom again sometime? And if so, when would I expect them to bloom? Well, paper whites. Paper whites are, I hope you would have, you enjoy them at Christmas. Oh, right? yes, I do. I, do. I love well, paper whites. They smell so good. Yeah, you're just, not going to be able to enjoy them again. Um, <laughs> the foliage is gone by now, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Right. So they really, when you have a bulb forced like that, it really sucks up a lot of energy and it needs to be planted outside with its foliage to replenish all those nutrients. Unfortunately, paper whites are not hardy in our area and not have a hardy bulbs. So what you can do is just put them in your compost pile and that's it. Buy them again next buy year. Buy them again next year. Right, buy them again <clears> next year. In fact, forcing all bulbs, you know, People force hyacinths in the winter time, and that's a great thing to do. But again, it's that how are you going to replenish the nutrient question that, that makes it uh, difficult for them to continue on. Okay, so Easter's coming, and Mother's Day is not far behind. And if somebody gives me one of those beautiful basins of blooming spring bulbs, ah. what do I do with the, those? All right. Well, certainly enjoy them for a couple of days, but what I would suggest is, you know, you're going to be spending more time outside. Take the container out with you and enjoy it on your patio or your deck uh, or your porch. And then when the blooms stop, you can plant it. You per se, just dig a hole, gently lift that dirt out of the container and plant it per se cover it up and with any luck next spring. Now, again, you gotta have your foliage there. You gotta have your foliage. Okay, so up. you pick the yeah. whole thing up, up, put it in, plant it in there, cover it up, cover up, you know, make sure the, Give, the bulbs are covered. Right, but the bulbs yeah. covered and it's sort of, it's even with the ground yeah, around yeah, it, right. but the, the yeah, leaves the are still up. Yeah, and then with any luck next <clears throat> spring, you will. I'll have, uh, it'll be reborn. Yeah, it'll be reborn. It 
Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, that is. I certainly hope that you all have as much fun as I have listening to Meg, combining stories about the flowers and how to take care of them in our own gardens. I'm not sure I'll ever look at a tulip again without thinking about that tulip crash in 1637. By a house with one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you all have enjoyed that, this event, please make a donation or become a member of the Historical Society of Harford County. You can visit our website at www.harfordhistory.org. Um, I also want to invite you to come and partic to participate in or watch a number of our upcoming events. On April the 13th, we'll have a genealogy workshop one of famous and infamous people with, with links to Harford County. And that will be at 7 p.m. on April the 13th. On May 10th will be our next Brown Bag Lunch, and we'll be talking about the Star Spangled Banner Trail. Uh, again, that one will be at 12.30 in the afternoon. On May 11th, we'll have yet another genealogy workshop, this one on how to use how to research using military records. That'll be at 7 p.m. And then on May 21st, we're going to have an in-person event. Again, uh, it will be Adventures at the Aegis with S. Todd Holden. Many of you know Todd. Um, he was with Aegis forever as a, a photographer. That will be at 4 p.m. at Broom's Bloom Dairy here on 543. There is a charge for that. It's about $10. But we really hope we'll see you there. Reserve your tickets for any of these events on our website, www.harfordhistory.org. On the website, you'll find not only these events listed, but you'll find more about the history of Harford County and instructions for how to join the society. <clears throat> Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again next month.